help someone when they are dying. We often find this very difficult. In fact, it's something most of us try to avoid. Yet the reality is that most of us know someone who is dying or someone who has a family or extended family member or a close friend who is dying. So our topic for this morning is a central one for our life. King David makes it very clear in this passage that all of us are going to die. And most, if not all of us, will come into close personal contact with someone who is dying. Let's hear not only David's words this morning, but the feelings he must have been feeling. Let's begin by looking at this passage. Please open up your Bibles, pull out your message outlines, and follow along as I begin reading in Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. You have made him old before his time and publicly disgraced him. O oh Lord, how long will this go on? Will you hide yourself forever? How long will your anger burn like fire? Remember how short my life is, how empty and futile this human existence. No one can live forever. All will die. No one can escape the power of the grave. Thank you, Dave. Being at the bedside of someone who is dying is both uh, a great challenge and a great privilege as a pastor. It is a great privilege to be with people, to talk with people, to support and encourage people as they die. But it is also one of the most challenging things that I do on a, on a, a week-to-week, month-to-month basis. In fact, it, it seems this year uh, we've had a few more deaths than we have in a, an average year. In the last two and a half months, 13 uh, members of our church have passed away. I've done eight memorial services in the last two months. David is right. All of us are going to die. We're all going to die. No one is going to escape death. In fact, Paul says that the wages of sin is death. The fact that we live in a sin-affected world. The ultimate result of that is is that we're going to die. So far, that statistic is 100%. How do we usually respond when we know someone is is dying, when we discover that we are dying? We used to think of this response in a more linear fashion as counselors and therapists and psychologists, but uh, today and my experience is, is that it's not so linear. These are the the phases or stages that we go through, the thoughts that we have, but uh, we often do it in a very circular manner. We revisit some of that process from time to time. That process always begins with denial. This can't be happening to me, or this can't be happening to them. And the truth is, is we all want to live in denial when it comes to our death. We want to hold it off at least at arm's length. We want to deny that it's happening even though we see the pending results in the mirror every day. It's the second law of thermodynamics, right? The law of entropy. That means it doesn't look as good today as it did a year ago, right? 
I know I'm getting older because I used to say, you know, I, I'd look at myself and I'd say, you know, I, I, look, I think I look pretty good. Now I look at the mirror and I say, you know, for an old guy, you, you look pretty good for your age. We want to deny the fact that one day we're going to die. We want to deny the reality that actually we are dying every day. We want to ignore it. And because we want to ignore it and deny its reality in our own life, we have great difficulty in getting our arms around that reality when it's actually happening to someone around us, a loved one, a family member, extended family member, a close friend, a neighbor. We want to deny that it's happening because we want to deny it's happening to us. Now what's interesting is David is all through what I want to say today. It's amazing how he was so attuned to his real emotions and had a, a unique ability to put a pen to what he was feeling. He writes in Psalm 55, 4, he says, I am frightened inside. The terror of death has attacked me. Most everybody has a little fear, a little, a little terror in their heart and their soul when the reality of death strikes. And if it's come in a very traumatic way, that's even a greater jolt to us because we have no ability to really process our denial ahead of time. And we not only need to deal with the grief and the loss of someone, but the denial that we've been living under as well. Denial often leads to anger. And when we're angry, we're angry at everybody. We start with God. We're mad at God. Then we're mad at everybody else. We're mad at them. Then we're finally, we finally realize that we're mad at us. And we often play the coulda, woulda, shoulda game. And the more we play that game, the angrier we become about the whole thing. I was overcome with anger, David writes. The more I thought, the more troubled I became. Isn't that true when you're dealing with someone who's dying? When you're dealing with death? When you're dealing with your own immortality? The more we think about it, the, the, the more we feel life slipping away. The more we have to deal with what comes along as we mature and age. Boy, it makes us mad, doesn't it? it? Makes us angry. Denial, anger, oh, okay. Since I know God's in charge, I'm going to bargain my way out of this. Or I'm going to bargain for someone else. Lord, if you spare their life, I promise I will. I'll do this or I'll do that. In the, uh, in the military service, that's called uh, a foxhole prayer, a foxhole conversion. Lord, if you get me out of here, and many, mel many military people have prayed that prayer. Lord, if you get me out of here, I promise I'll go to church every Sunday. Lord, I promise if you get, if you get me out of here, uh, I'll, I'll serve you in any way that I can. Lord, you get me out of here, I promise I'll tithe the rest of my life. Pray that prayer today, will you? <laughs> and we bargain, don't we? We even bargain mentally with God as we age. Lord, if you just, help, if you just let me do this. If I can just do this one, I've heard this over and over. If I can, I, I'm going to do this one more time before I can't do it anymore. And good for you. Do it one more time. Because it may be the last time that you do it. I was overcome with anger. 
Yeah, death makes us angry. The loss of life, the loss of potential and the opportunity of life, it does make us angry. And then we begin to bargain. You can never pay God enough to stay alive forever and be safe from death. You know what's really interesting is to watch what people with a lot of money do as they die is they often think they can buy favor with God because they didn't feel that they had favor with God throughout their life. Oh, I'm getting to the end. I better earn my way into heaven. Well, guess what? You can't earn your way into heaven. David even knows that. You can't give enough money. You can't do enough service. Everybody's at least one dollar short or one good act short of getting into heaven. The great thing is is that God's paid the price and it's His good work on the cross that gets us into heaven. But we do want to bargain our way, don't we? Denial, anger, bargaining, Finally, it makes us depressed. And I'll say this. If you have not been a little depressed about death, it probably means that you've not really dealt with death in your life. You haven't, you haven't faced your own mortality. Because facing your own mortality, having to really sort out your feelings about death, it will make you feel a little depressed, and it ought to. All of these feelings are real feelings. And even if you haven't felt the other feelings, you ought to feel the feeling of of depression to some degree. You must mourn the loss of of, uh, life and of death. Everybody does. Everybody needs to. David does. David writes, I'm at the end of my rope. My life is in ruins. I'm fading away to nothing. I'm passing away. We know that that's true. We see the evidence of that on some regular basis. I was reminded of that last night. Had a couple over for dinner who were driving through the area. They were in our small group 26 years ago. Uh, and our, our kids grew up together. Uh, I, in fact, in my office, I have a little picture of our boys dressed up to do the Christmas story, a little towel on their head and little robes. And, and we had a little Christmas dinner together as a small group, and then all the kids reenacted the, the, uh, the Christmas play in their house. Great memories. They rolled out of the car. They haven't aged a bit. They looked fantastic. We all change. Yeah, they had changed, but they looked very good. We have to face the fact that we're all going to die. We have to face the fact that right now we're all dying. And once we we feel the depression of our own mortality or the mortality of dying and death of someone around us, it's a very freeing thing. It's extremely freeing. Because we change from being mad at God and everyone else to finally saying, okay God, you know, I've got a lot to celebrate because I know my life is in your hands. I know that you have a plan for my life, and it's not only a plan when I'm living, you got a plan for me for when I die. What happens after I die? And here I would challenge you to look at all the world religions. I, I, I heard it again the other day. Well, you know, all religion, it's just one side, different sides of the same mountain. I can tell you what. What's at the top of the mountain? Ask that question when you look at the Muslim religion. Ask that question when you look at Buddhism, Eastern thought. Ask that question when you look at Confucianism. Ask that thought when you think about Christianity, and I can tell you, the heaven of the Bible is a much preferred place to be 
than what's described in any other world religion, frankly, in any other philosophy of life. Heaven, as it's depicted in the Scriptures, is to give us comfort in our dying, in, in the dying of someone else. Because it will be a glorious place. We'll be completely in the glory of God. Wow. Be awesome. Now those are the feelings, those are our normal reactions, and like I mentioned, they're not necessarily linear. Uh, just because you get depressed, it doesn't mean you're not going to go back and get angry again. Just because you begin to get your arms around the reality that you are going to die, it doesn't mean that you're not going to bargain any longer. What happens? David says, I'm trusting you, O Lord, saying, you are my God. My future is in your hands. And whether you know it or not, your future is in God's hands. He holds all the cards. He holds all the cards. And lucky for us, he loves us. He's a merciful and gracious God. And he has a plan for us that's good. A plan for us to prosper. And even in our death, we prosper, don't we? Because Christ promises us, as he has resurrected, we will resurrect too. Now what do we do? How do we respond to those around us who are, who are dying? And I'm simply simply going to take the word comfort and use it as an acrostic and take you through those seven points. Let's begin. C is, is first of all, you've got to confront your own denial of mortality. Your own fear of death. I, I can tell you, you don't want to be around anybody dying if you haven't dealt with your own mortality. I know you don't. You want to keep them at arm's length. You want to love them from the doorway of the hospital or the bedroom. Because if you don't resolve those, your own feelings of mortality, of death, you can't get close to anybody who's dying. When I was in seminary, we had a mentor, professor, pastor who talked to us about that. And he said 90% of the students graduating have never dealt with death. And they've never confronted their own fears of death, their own denials of their own death. And he pretty much looked at us straight in the eye and said, and you better deal with it before you get there. Because if you have to come alongside of someone uh, who is dying in the hospital and you haven't dealt with that, you're not going to be any good to them. You're going to miss a great opportunity for ministry, a needed opportunity for ministry. So we have to first begin with our own, our, our own fears of death. It's interesting, all the way back to Adam, Adam said, I was afraid and I was naked and I hid. What do we do when we, when we face difficult emotions? We want to hide from them. We want to deny them. We can't do that. Number two is we have to offer our physical presence. When we started this series of messages, I, I gave you, I think, some very good advice. Show up and shut up. Right? Show up and shut up when you're helping somebody. Now, today I'm going to tell you you need to say some things, but first of all, you just need to show up. You need to be physically close to someone who is dying. I can't tell you the number of times when I've prayed with someone who is dying in the hospital or in their home, they grab a hold of my hand for dear life. They, if I get close to them, they, if I put my hand on, they reel me in and give me a hug. And when there's tubes and stuff coming out of people, that's something I want you to know. It's a great privilege that they would want my embrace in that moment. And they do. They all want your embrace. They all want you to touch them, to be with them to be present with them. They just don't want to be alone, and David knows that. I look for someone to come and help me. 
But no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit about what happens to me. That's the prayer of people who are passing away in our community that don't have children or don't have children that live in the area. That's why our deacons go and visit anyone who is uh, terminally ill. That's why I go and visit uh, anyone who is terminally ill because they just need someone to be with them. They don't want to die, so to speak, alone, although they may want to die alone. You may come and be present with them, and when you, when you leave, they'll pass away because they want to be in control of when they die, and they don't want to die in front of you. But in general, people don't want to die alone. Uh, they want to know that someone is there uh, with them, physically present. We need to minister to them in practical ways. David says, I'm burning with fever and I'm near death. I'm worn out and utterly crushed. My heart is troubled and I groan in pain. How do we respond to a person like that? Paul says to Timothy, take tender care of those who are, who are weak. I was visiting someone in this congregation who was dying. Uh, and when I arrived one day, someone from the church, not even a deacon, had beat me there. And they were putting lotion on the, this person's feet and legs. They had edema and, and that, that massage of that lotion was very comforting to her. And I stopped as I went into the room and I thought, boy, I, 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 don't, I don't think I'd like doing that. You ever touched the feet of someone who's dying? They're cold. They're clammy. But this woman very happily massaged. I, I asked her, I said, oh, I, you know, gee, is this the first time you've shown up? And she pleasantly said, no, I, I come just about every other day. Because I, I, I know that they, they have pain in their legs and, and I want to massage that and, and, and bring some comfort to her as she dies. Wow. We need to comfort those who are dying and we need to comfort those in very practical ways who are around that person who is dying. That's why we do meal assistance for people. It's just one less thing for them to think about. We'll bring them, and we're really good. When we bring them a meal, it'll feed them for three days. Practical assistance. We all need practical assistance. We need to minister to others in a practical way. What does Paul say to Timothy? Take tender care. Nobody needs tender care more than those who are dying. We also need to fortify them with our emotional support. Now, if you can't be there physically, I can guarantee you you'll never be there emotionally. And I know people who are physically present who are not really emotionally present because they're still living in denial. They're still living in fear. And the reason we need to emotionally connect with that other person is a natural way that God created us is when we get near death, there's almost always a point where the person dying goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm dying. And they get a little terror and a little fear and a little worry. And it isn't as though they don't believe in eternity. They do. But the natural survival instinct within all of us kind of causes that to happen. And right in that moment, what they need is they need to borrow the faith of someone else. They need someone else to say, you know, it's okay to be afraid, but you need to remember your life is in God's hand and He loves you. Most of us are not afraid of dying. We're afraid of how we're going to die. Tom Carlin passed away a few weeks ago. I visited him in the hospital and 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 
uh, the privilege I get is I get to have the conversation with people about how they're feeling about their death. And to really have that conversation, you've got to emotionally be present. That's one of the, actually one of the most tiring things of being a pastor, is being emotionally present when people are dying. Because you know, you can't fake that, they know. They know. They know whether you're connecting with them emotionally or whether you're just doing your business as a pastor. And as Tom and I talked, Tom said, man, I'm not afraid to die. In fact, I'm a little excited about it. He says, but what, but what just strikes fear in me is I'm afraid of how I'm going to die. And isn't that all of us? I, 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 I don't, you know, if I die, great. But I want to go from here to there like that. I don't want to hang around a long time in the process. And I was able to tell Tom, I said, don't worry, you just stay close to your morphine and you will either uh, lose consciousness or go to sleep and never wake up again. And that's how he passed away. We have to realize that we must be emotionally present for other people. Carry each other's burdens. And if you're honest about it. You don't want to carry anybody else's burdens. you got enough of your own. But yet we're called to carry the emotional as well as the practical burdens of other people. They need that, and frankly, we need to do that ourselves. We, we need that as well. We should be willing to open up the conversation with the person who is dying and the question that we should often ask is, how are you really feeling? Now, we don't want to ask that question because we're afraid of what's going to come out. But I'm the one that routinely gets to ask that question. I'll say, how are you really feeling about it? Are you afraid? Are you worried? You feel guilty? How do you really feel? And to ask a person who's dying how they really feel, that's the connection they're looking for. And frankly, if you can ask that question and not go like this when they start to give us the answer, then, then you know that you're really emotionally present with that other person. You'll know that you've really processed your denial about death. Because if you haven't, you won't, you won't want to ask that question. You'll talk about the weather. You'll ask them about the food. You'll even ask them what the doctor said. But you will not look them in the eye and say, how do you really feel? How are you really doing? But that's what a dying person desires, is someone to really ask them. A person's thoughts are like water in a deep well, but someone with insight can draw them out. We don't want to plummet the deep well of death because we're afraid we're going to fall in. And we're so worried about falling in that we can't draw the thoughts and the feelings, the fears of someone who's dying. We need to remember that the family members have needs too. I, I, I interviewed one person on this a couple of weeks ago. And I said, okay, if I say one thing in my message, what do you want me to say? And they told me this. They said, when I was in the room after my loved one died, everybody talked about them and I felt as though I was invisible to them. Isn't it interesting? They're the ones that lost the loved one, and no one is talking to them. No one's caring for them. No one's being present with them. No one's asking them, how do you really feel? And I know why we don't ask it, because we know they don't feel good. They feel grief. They feel loss. They feel depression. They feel denial. And I have been 
at the side of people when someone has tragically died. And almost to the person, the family members that are there are in denial. They have a hard time grabbing a hold of that reality. And in that moment and in the moments that follow, they need emotional connection from someone else. Each of you should look to the needs of others. And wow, when it's around death, we're looking out for our own needs, our own emotions, our own fears. And as we process those and and get a handle on them, now we're ready to really help someone else. And then finally, and this is not last for any other reason, because this is the last thing that you'll remember I say today, and that is turn them to Jesus. Turn them to Jesus. Acts 4.12 says that there's no other name given in all of heaven that can bring salvation, only Jesus Christ. And the great thing about God is you can be on your deathbed and you can convert right there. You can be on your deathbed and you can say, Lord, I've run from you my whole life. I want you to be the leader of my life. And God is gracious enough to grant that prayer. Now that person's missed out their whole life. The great blessings and benefits of having Jesus Christ be the leader of their life. But God will not turn away anyone who is willing to confess Him as Savior and Lord. Even if it's the next to the last breath they ever breathe. What I try to remind those that are dying is Psalm 23, 4. You are now walking through the dark valley of death. And you should not fear because God is always with you. You see, when we die and go to heaven, we don't go alone, the Bible says. Jesus is the one who walks us from here to there. And the proof of that is being around pe- people who are, who are going to die in the matter of of, of moments, they often have one foot in heaven and one foot here. And they share all sorts of observations, feelings, conversations. That's one of the ways I know heaven exists because I've seen people with one foot there, one foot here, carrying on conversations with people in heaven. Waking up for a moment and saying, you know, it's true. I've just been there, and now I'm going there forever. A person who is dying, someone who around them has suffered death, that person needs help. They need us to be the helping hands and arms and emotions, the support, the encouragement that they need. The great truth of the gospel is that no one should fear death. God did not create us to fear death. Fear is something that sin has brought into this world. God does love you and he has a plan for your life and that means this life as well as eternal life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I'm thankful that you surround us with your presence. Lord, for those of us that are grieving this morning because this has brought back a lot of feelings and memories of the death of a loved one, Lord, I ask that your caring and and comforting hand would be upon them. Lord, those that we know that are represented by those in this room, Uh, that are in the process of dying, Lord, I ask that your hand of comfort and care would be upon them. And Lord, we are exceedingly grateful for the reality of heaven. That although you've wired us with an intrinsic fear and denial of, of our mortality, our death, because of your death, we need to fear no 
longer. Amen.